it's a good number of people. Yeah, like. very good. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jaroslava, and I'm the director of programs at the Mexican Cultural Center. And we'd just like to thank everyone on behalf of the Cultural Center and the Consulate for uh, coming out tonight on such a beautiful evening. Um, and we'd like to thank you all for coming out and celebrating the centennial anniversary of the Mexican Constitution. Um, this is an event that the Consulate of Mexico and the Cultural Center, as well as the National Constitution Center, have been talking about for over a year. So we're excited that it's finally happening today. Um, and before we get into the program, I'd like to mention that following the panel discussion, there will be some time for questions and answers. So there will be two mics that will be going around if you have any questions, or if you'd rather write your questions down, there are also index cards um, for that. And I'll now pass the time to Consul Kerber for some welcoming remarks. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Yaron. Uh, first of all, thank you all of you for being here on behalf of the Consulate of Mexico and the Mexican Cultural Center, and especially thanks to the National Constitutional Th Center for co-organizing this event and hosting us, us in this very beautiful and inspiring building. I'm not good at improvising, so I have some ideas that I would like to highlight, especially in this centennial of the Mexican Constitution. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the presence of official representatives of the city of Philadelphia and to recognize the great city of Philadelphia for supporting its commitment to diversity, confirming once again that the United States is the land of the free and the home of the brave, but it's also the land of the pioneers and home of thousands of immigrants. For those who had studied constitutional law, it's well known that no constitution is born without sustenance. They are daughters of their time and feet of sources of other texts, whether contemporary or older. They learn from the mistakes of others, becoming more and more perfect. Constitutions are social constructs made between rulers and governed to achieve an harmonious life. They include duties and rights and use a broad and comprehensive language to facilitate consensus and approval of the text. When controversies arise, they are resolved by different levels on the judicial branch. And the most difficult cases are decided upon the highest courts, such as the Supreme Court of Justice in Mexico and the Supreme Court of the United States. Today, we celebrate 100 years of the promulgation of the Mexican Constitution, a legal instrument that gave historical importance and projection of future to the Mexican Revolution, incorporating not only first generation of human rights, but also social rights such as education, land, and work, which have allowed it to be recognized as the first constitution of a social nature. With its 136 articles, our constitution allows us to establish the country that we envision. But I am sure that none of the original constituents imagined that a hundred years later, despite its more than 600 reforms and additions done, it will remain a valid and living legal instrument. Today, in its 100 years, some voices propose the writing of a new constitution that enables removing from it the issues that should be addressed at a different level of policies. Others are inclined to maintain its flexibility but to add justice to the changing reality. These divergent positions force us to ask after 100 years of its promulgation if it will be more convenient to have a more rigid constitution like the American one, which in its 200 years has only had, thir had 30 reforms. Quite a difference. <laughs> to make an analysis of two of the most important constitutions in the content continent, we are joined by Mr. Raul Bringas Nosti. He's full, he is full-time professor and researcher at the Department of International Business Administration of the Universidad de las Americas Puebla, 
At this moment, his research focuses on the history of commercial businesses between Mexico and the United States. Very important for this moment. Yeah. He has a PhD in history specializing in Mexico and U.S. relations at Benemerita Universidad Autónoma de Puebla. He made, he made a postdoctoral research in history at Harvard University. He is certificate on the United States Constitution from Lafayette College, Pennsylvania. Mr. Donas, Thomas Donnelly, Senior Fellow for Constitutional Studies at the National Constitutional Center. He has served as Consul at Constitutional Accountability Center and as a Klimenko Fellow and Lecturer on Law at Harvard Law School. He received his law degree at Yale Law School and has written popular pieces of various outlets, including The Washington Post, The Atlantic, The New Republic, Politico, Slate, Washington Monthly, Talking Points Memo, CNN.com, Huffington Post, and The Hill. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, well, we would like to have like a very informal talk about uh, the importance of both constitutions, especially in these days that it has been said so much, not only in the United States, but also in, in Mexico, about the, uh, the importance of having this type of documents. Uh, I would like to begin asking um, uh, Mr. Bringas, for a country, what does it mean to have 100-year-old constitution, and also 200 years of constitution in the United States? Can we, can we begin? Well, somebody may say that 100 years are not, are not uh, many years if you compare the Mexican Constitution with the American Constitution. However, it is very rare that a constitution of one country uh, stays for so long. Uh, you may think about, for example, the Venezuela. Venezuela has had uh, 20 constitutions. Uh, Ecuador, 20 constitutions. Germany, three. So Mexico has had three constitutions. So having a constitution uh, for 100 years is an achievement. Uh, uh, for that reason, we are, we are pleased uh, because nobody thought that the Mexican constitution was, was going to be able to, to stay for so long. Uh, besides, um, uh, it is a very, very special constitution because uh, it was the first social constitution in history. Uh, what I mean uh, by social constitution, the first that had social rights uh, in it. In fact, the Mexican constitution inspired the Soviet constitution, which was written the next year in 1918, and the German Weimar constitution of 1919. Uh, in fact, if you read the, 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 the debates, the Soviet and the German, uh, the German debates, they were talking a lot about, about the Mexican constitution. So we are, we are very proud of that, of that achievement, uh, although time has passed and, and yeah. the constitution is not so good today. Yeah, and the Mexican Constitution has also inspired many of the Latin American constitutions, oh, of course, of no? Course. Mm -hmm. But for example, we can see that in the North American Constitution it has also 200 years, but it hasn't had so many reforms. Do you think that the North American Constitution is still valid, or does it need to be updated, or how it works here in the United States? Well, there's, there's a couple things to think about when it comes to the American uh, constitutional tradition. One is that our first framework of government totally failed. The Articles of Confederation very quickly fizzled out. Um, the Confederation was too weakly linked together. Um, the government was not given the power to tax, to regulate commerce, to really engage in foreign affairs. And so quite quickly, the leaders in our country decided we needed something else. We needed a different framework. Um, and that's how we eventually end up with, with the United States Constitution. When I think about our, our over 200 years um, in existence, you know, it's important to understand that we may have only had 27 amendments, um, but some of those amendments greatly transformed our republic. I mean, if we think about um, the Reconstruction Amendments, which are celebrating their 150th anniversary right now, our 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, we see Lincoln's new birth of freedom, we see the end of slavery, we see equality and promises of liberty written into our Constitution, we see the rights for African Americans to vote written in our Constitution. If we extend even beyond that, we see the expansion of the franchise to women, to young voters, um, to folks in the District of Columbia for voting in presidential elections. And so there are many ways in which, despite the fact our Constitution hasn't, hasn't had quite so many amendments, um, that some of these amendments had 
really a, 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 a remarkable effect. And I mean, the, the one final thing I'll say is, you know, thinking about the centennial of the Mexican Constitution, it's interesting to think about where we were in the centennial of the U.S. Constitution. Um, you know, we, we sort of, we mm. put our new Constitution in place. Um, you know, we had many things that the framers didn't envision, like the rise of, of political parties. We fought a bloody civil war where hundreds of thousands of people died. We put new amendments into the Constitution that were meant to enshrine the promises of our Declaration of Independence. Um, and then we quickly backtracked, and it would take us yet another 100 years in the 1960s in the Civil Rights Movement to continue to make our country better. And so um, it's exciting to think about 100 years uh, of your Constitution and, and thinking about how much change we even had from our 100th year to our 200th and now beyond. Yeah. So what do you think that are the similarities or difference between both constitutions? Because we can see the Mexican Constitution has had 600 reforms. So we have an article that has the same pages that uh, the North American <laughs> Constitution yeah. has. So what are we doing? Are we putting too much body into our Mexican Constitution? Do we require all the type of topics that we have put it on our Constitution? What do you think between both constitutions? Well, uh, um, well. Uh, 699 reforms, uh, a little bit more. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I maybe, to maybe, be a little bit polite. <laughs> well, maybe 700. We don't know what happens okay. uh, right now. No, well, let's but, uh, leave it but, like that. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the problem with the Mexican Constitution is that it was, it was um, elaborated as a reaction against uh, a dictator 100 years ago. We had a, a dictator who was in power for uh, 35 years. So um, in, those in those days, we had a constitution that was a copy of the American constitution, the best constitution that Mexico has had, the 1857 constitution. But Mexico is not the United States. And it was very difficult to adapt the individual um, ideology of the US into Mexico. So, so with that constitution, we had exploitation, we had uh, terrible social conditions. So the idea of the, of the Mexican constitution was to solve those problems. And for that reason, we had a social constitution. Well, but the, the, world, the world changed a lot in, in 100 years. Mexico was some kind of 100 years ago, socialist, socialist, populist, nationalistic, very nationalistic country. And right now, it is a very open country. We have, we have a free trade agreements with uh, 47 countries. So the Constitution has to evolve. The problem is that we, we come from a socialist populist tradition, and we are now a market-oriented country. So it creates a lot of tension, and for that reason, we have so many uh, uh, changes. Uh, I am, uh, I am um, of, of the few who think that Mexico should have a new constitution. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> let's see. <laughs> we can say, say, send that to Mexico. And what do you think about, <laughs> about the North American constitution? Because uh, when we talk about federation, it seems that we are talking about the same thing here in the United States and in Mexico. What do you understand as a federation here in the United States? Sure, so I mean, here it's always been sort of our ever-present challenge from both the Articles of Confederation and going into the US Constitution, figuring out the proper role of our national government versus how much power um, the states should have. And it's always been a jostling back and forth. Um, you know, there, there are certain amendments that we've had, like the 13th, like the 14th, that have really increased national power at the expense of state power, but we, we always have a tradition, or we've, we've long had a tradition of, you know, saying that there are certain things that are best done together through our national government, while at the same time understanding that the virtue of federalism, the virtue of states' rights, is that it allowed, allows for self-governance at a more local level where we can experiment with new policies um, that sometimes are adopted by the national government, sometimes not, but there's a way in which sort of that constant tension provides a space for experimentation at the policy level and ideally freedom at both the national level and freedom of choice at, 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 the, at the local and state level. And so it's, it's sort of an ever-present challenge. Because uh, we see this, in, especially in the international level, when we talk about, I don't know, human rights. I, I don't know if you know about this Avena case uh, where 
many that were inmates that were sentenced to death penalty. Uh, the case was raised by Mexico to, to the international tribunals, and the international tribunal said, yes, there was a not respected that due process, so Texas needs to revise those cases. But because um, Texas is Texas, they decided that those cases were not going to revise. It seems that the autonomy and the independence of the states here in the United States is quite different of the states in Mexico. What can you tell us about that independence in Mexico? Yes, the problem in Mexico was, um, as I told you, we, we had three constitutions. We have had three constitutions. The first one, the, the Constitution of 1824, uh, was very federalist, more, than federalist more, more, more federalist than the American Constitution. Uh, and you know the result? The result was the disintegration of Mexico. Mexico was a country that uh, extended from Oregon until Panama. Uh, and, and states began to, uh, to, to leave Mexico. A similar process as the one you had here with the Civil War. You, uh, you know, at, when, when a country begins, uh, so the tensions between the states and, and the central government are powerful. Mexico was not able to solve them. So the solution was less federalism in the Constitution, and that's, wh that's what, what happens today. We don't have so many federal rights uh, for, this, for the states, uh, no, not too many, uh, not a great autonomy, uh, because we are afraid of the past. Uh, and if you think that Mexico uh, shrink uh, to half its size, so you, you see the dangers of, of federalism, of strong uh, So we are system. more centralized? Yes, yes. We say we are federal, we are not. And do you, federal, do you think that is not. healthy for our system? It is not healthy, but uh, it is a, a, fear, a fear tradition. We are afraid of, of losing more territory or, or having less power or being less, less uh, a unity. So uh, those are the fears of, of the past, and, and that's working against federalism in Mexico. And here in the United States, for example, to seeing these cases, especially of human rights, uh, when you see the federalism, the characteristics of the federalism here in the United States, do you think that the independence of the, of United, of the states of the United States uh, gives a, um, how can I say, a, a nice image of the United States as a whole? When they reject like an international decision? Well, I mean, so, I think we've achieved a, a couple of things constitutionally in this country, especially from the late 19th century onward. One is, you know, coming out of Reconstruction and into, you know, especially a lot of what happened at the Supreme Court in the 20th century. Sort of the legacy of the 14th Amendment is that at the national level, there are certain fundamental rights that states cannot abridge. And so if you looked at the United States and state action before the Civil War, for instance, there were plenty of states that didn't um, respect fundamental rights even within our country, like free speech. Um, and we, what we see after the ratification of the 14th Amendment and then with many Supreme Court cases in the 20th and into the 21st century is that finally we say there are certain things, there are a certain set of rights that are so fundamental to being American, to being an American citizen, that the federal government's gonna protect that against the states. That's free speech. That's, you know, just a couple years ago, that's an individual right to bear arms to protect your home. It, it ends up, sort of spanning the ideological spectrum, um, but they are things that are often committed textually in our constitution or embedded in our legal tradition. And so there's a way in which states have uh, uh, a scope of action, um, sometimes in economic policy, et cetera, et cetera, where there could be different policies in different states, uh, but there are certain things where our constitution and our courts have said, no, that's just un-American and you can't do that anymore. The one other thing I will say about the states that's interesting, I think, visa in, in looking at the Mexican Constitution in preparation for tonight, is the degree to which a lot of our state constitutions look a lot more like the Mexican Constitution. So as an American, what's striking about reading the Mexican Constitution is one, uh, what you have both already mentioned, which is just how long it is. It reads a lot more um, like a legal code than like what we're used to and seeing in our Constitution, which is so short. The other is that our state constitutions actually protect many social rights, many of the rights that are uh, 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 enshrined in, in, in your constitution, such as a right to a healthy environment, a right to, an edu a right to education. Um, and so there's a way in which our state tradition, um, although different than the US constitution, is in certain ways textually similar to the Mexican constitution. Hmm. 
So, for example, um, we received some questions from the public once we announced that we were going to have this event. And one of the questions that I would like to raise to you is, in recent years, we have seen the debates generated by appointing a general attorney or a minister of Supreme Court, either in Mexico or in the United States. Does this mean that the courts have become so politized over the years that they no longer quit the check and balances that they were supposed to be? Uh, well, in Mexico, uh, you cannot say that uh, the Supreme Court is politized, politized um, because the Supreme Court, um, I, I, was, uh, I, I will say something very direct, uh, it, it works for the government, uh, really. We, it, it doesn't have enough independence. Um, it has independence in some issues, but in some others, uh, the very, very important issues uh, basically, it reacts to the to the wishes of the presidency. Uh, we have seen that uh, many times. Uh, so I cannot say that it is politi politicized, because because uh, basically the people uh, who are there are are appointed uh, are appointed by by you know to to fill to fulfill. Um, their role as government officials. Uh, I didn't know how to say it, but <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a very political way, but, but that's the way it is working. And the, now, these days, we have seen a lot of activity because of the, of, uh, the general attorney has been named no? by the new administration. What uh, do you think about this? Well, I mean, I, I think if, if, if you know, looking at the Supreme Court itself, I mean, it is sometimes criticized as being uh, political. I mean, I think what's notable about our Supreme Court vis-a-vis -vis the other branches of government um, are that, you know, you will actually see some decisions that span the ideological spectrum on the court. So if you look at Congress, we very rarely see compromise anymore. Things are very polarized. Um, at the Supreme Court, the, a, a, a majority of the cases that get there that are really tough are decided by justices that Combine both the progressive and liberal wing, uh, the progressive and conservative wings. Um, that's not to say that there aren't certain really important cases, and many of the most important cases don't divide the justices based on which party appointed them. I mean, these questions, I mean, the, the one thing that's baked in the cake of the United States Constitution is that it's written in broad terms, it's very hard to amend, and so it ends up being a framework of debate about some of the most important values that we care about. We care so much that we put them in our constitution. And so, you know, there ends up being a mix of certain cases towards the end of each term that are on more hot button topics, whether it's gun rights or LGBT rights or free speech um, that can often divide our justices along ideological lines. But there are also humongous cases where you see um, justices from across the spectrum coming together, sometimes on environmental cases. You'll sometimes mm. see Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kennedy joining with the progressives. Um, on criminal procedure cases, sometimes you'll see Justice Stephen Breyer, who's traditionally progressive, joining with the conservatives. And so there is a bit more of a jumble, and there's a, a degree of, I think, independence among the justices that is, uh, has decreased over time as the elected branches of our government have become more polarized. So you really see that there's the check and balances are there. And, and the court has, it has a mixed record over time. I mean, there, you know, there were, you know, there's the, a lot of the cases, some of the cases that we look at um, and we lament the most are particularly times where we see individual rights trampled upon, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, for instance, like uh, the Korematsu decision during World War II where the Supreme Court uh, allowed for the internment of uh, Japanese in the United States. Uh, but at the same time, you'll also see, you know, in the early aughts where um, it, it growing out of the war on terror, the Bush administration doing, uh, you know, certain things to promote security, you saw certain checks from the Supreme Court that at least limited the scope of action. And so there's a way in which I, I can't say, it's not a binary thing where I'd, where I'd say, it's not always, it's not always a rubber stamp uh, sometimes, off, sometimes there's a check, sometimes there, there, there's not, and um, if nothing else, it shows that the court acts independently sometimes, even if not, not all of the time. I, I can give you an example of how the Mexican su Supreme Court works. For example, you know the, 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 the drug lord El Chapo, El Chapo uh, 
uh, he was going to be extradited to the U.S. So Mexico needed to extradite him uh, the last day of, of, uh, of the Obama's government mm. in order to, to give an impression of cooperation. So the Supreme Court said, okay, uh, he may go. So it was done the, the last day, uh, and that's the way it works. Um, it is a, a court that, that uh, it has some independence in, in, in some small matters, but in others, there's not this ideological debate. Mm. It, it is more uh, some, some official branch of, 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 the, of the government. Mm. And that's, that's a problem that we have to solve. Yeah, in behalf of the Supreme Court of Mexico, I would like to say that uh, just a few years ago, the Supreme Court of Mexico was recognized by the United Nations because of the work that it was done in human rights. Yes. So that's something good for the Supreme Court, no? But uh, talking about that, mm -hmm. what is the difference between garantías individuales or individual liberties mm -hmm. included in the Mexican Constitution and the Bill of Rights of the U.S. Constitution? Sure, I mean, I, I think that there is considerable overlap in some of the themes that you mm -hmm. see in, in, in the two documents. So you'll see, you know, certain provision for the protection of free speech, of free press, assembly. Um, uh, you'll see, um, you know, provisions dealing with uh, individual right to bear arms. Um, you see many, uh, many different provisions dealing with the rights of the accused. Um, I think what's notable in, in reading the Mexican Constitution is there you know, within each of those rights, there is more detail. Mm. Um, and then furthermore, be pre precisely because the Mexican Constitution is so much longer and more comprehensive, you also have s many things that you don't see in our Constitution, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. a right to yeah. food, <laughs> shelter, yeah. healthcare, yes. education, yes. yes. um, anti-monopolistic language, like on and on. And so there's just, frankly, just more in there. But there's certainly overlap in terms of mm -hmm. uh, uh, a, a lot of the most fundamental things mm -hmm. that both mm -hmm. countries seem to care about. And in the Mexican Constitution, how do you see Well, the, the Mexican Constitution has, um, uh, as, uh, um, as, as Tom said, um, many things in, uh, that you see in the American Constitution. And those uh, things um, uh, come from the American Constitution and the Spanish Constitution of 1812, uh, which, wa which was one of the first liberal constitutions in history. So Mexico uh, kept th those traditions, those liberal traditions uh, in the Constitution. So we have uh, uh, human rights there, uh, which are very similar to the American uh, uh, human rights in the Constitution, individu uh, individual guarantees. Uh, however, the second part of the Constitution is very social, and sometimes it, it goes against those human rights, because we have in the Constitution those human rights together with a strong state. So mm. as you know, the state uh, sometimes opposes individual rights. So we have there a very strange dynamic where when the state uh, gets more power, individual rights go uh, have less, less considerations. So uh, we have to, to, to deal with that balance, and that's very difficult for the Mexican Constitution. But most of the rights that the American Constitution has, uh, the Mexican Constitution reflects them in, in the text. But don't you think that the Mexican Constitution has lost its social view Yes. Now that we have these neoliberal views and yes. proposals, so do you really think that it will be better for the Mexican uh, society to rewrite a new constitution? Wouldn't it be a little bit dangerous? We have just seen the new experience with the constitution of Mexico City. Mm -hmm. It was a complete... <laughs> mess to see yes, the yes. list. <laughs> but the, the discussions were terrible. And at the end, we created like a little Frankenstein yeah, that yes, is going yes. to work, but it's our Frankenstein. Well, well I could tell you of, of, uh, about another mess. For example, uh, the Mexican Constitution had, let's, let's speak in terms of numbers. It had uh, 20, 21,000 words when, when uh, it began. Uh, today, it has 65,000 words, 10,000 words were added in the last four years. So every single year, more words and words come into the text. So you cannot go that way. Uh, if you are into the modern world economy yeah. and you have a social constitution that came from a, a, a social revolution, then 
the only way out uh, to avoid that uh, war create, creating process is a new constitution. And we don't have to be afraid of that. Many countries have new constitutions, and, and that's where I, I, I would stress the most important difference between the Mexican and the American constitution. The US uh, are, or the country, is the constitution. The constitution is the essence, the legal essence of the US. The US were born from the constitution. Mexico was born before we had three constitutions, as many countries have had, I think most countries or all countries have had many constitutions. And, and there's no problem, there's no, there's no problem. Uh, we have been here with our constitution for 100 years, but we, we can have a new wife, you know, we, we, can, okay. we, can, we can remarry. Uh, so okay. there's no problem, there's no problem about it. Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, we, we could have some difference there. But <laughs> <laughs> Here is a question that I really like it when we receive it because it says, in this area of technology advances where a tweet can influence the perception in the community and even in judges, do you think that the system established to carry out constitutional reform to speak in the name of with the people need to be modified or updated? That's interesting. Um, I mean, I think that what technology allows is for, you know, I, I, I think it both has, has you know, positives and negatives. I think positively it allows people, allows movements to connect and grow and um, really grow without the need for the imprimatur of an elite media or anything like that. So there's a way in which sort of organic communities can grow. I mean, the downside of technology and why our process of, of constitutional reform is so difficult right now, and maybe that's a feature or a bug of our system. It depends on your view of constitutional reform generally, your normative view, but it's that um, we tend to now silo, silo ourselves into different information bubbles. And so there's a way in which we, the people, are more easily divided because we're consuming news that from news and, co and having conversations in bubbles of people who tend to agree with us. And so there's a way in which we often aren't I mean, the, President Obama in his farewell speech, I mean, it, it said this a bit, where it's, you know, where people aren't really talking to strangers, and especially strangers who disagree with them. We self-segregate into particular neighborhoods physically. We self-segregate information-wise into different, um, uh, uh, you know, it, through social media, through the news that we're consuming, and there's a way in which we as a common people uh, maybe don't exist as much as we did um, uh, 50 years ago. And so that makes it difficult for us to talk to each other and to potentially compromise in the deep way that requires, uh, for a constitutional reform, we, we, we want it to be uh, a product of consensus and supermajority, and it tends to be more difficult to find that now uh, than, than before. So we can, find we can find more communities that identify with us, but maybe that community isn't quite as broad um, as it once was. So it's so both, 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 both challenges and, 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 and opportunities, perhaps. So will you propose a reform? for that, or you are okay with all the complete processes that requires to make a reform? I mean, I think it's really hard, so, you know. Young people uh, like you really treat everything. Well, no, I mean, I, I don't, I, honestly, I mean, there's nothing we could, we, we in this country believe deeply in the freedom of speech and free information and the free flow of information, and so the hope is that over time, the more we learn, the more, Frustrated would you get, perhaps, with how the, system, that they, how the system is that we'll eventually break out and talk to each other and, and, and um, you know, if we need to reform our government and reform our constitution. I mean, if there's one thing that goes all the way back to the founding and goes back to the spirit of James Madison and James Wilson right down the street here, it's the spirit of constitutional experimentation and reform and the enlightenment ideal that, you know, we can learn, with what, learn from what came before and create something better. Um, and cyclically, we've been able to do that as a country. So I remain sort of constitutionally optimistic, even if there are certain ways in which um, it feels like we're in uh, a, a divided time with some, you know, uh, it, uh, sort of a need for bridging divides uh, that exist right now. And in Mexico, it exists also this scepticism to present some type of reform from the community because you know that there's going to be, we are going to need to follow a very, complete process of a lot of time and people and meetings and all that. What do you think about making it more vivid, more accurate? Yes, um, 
I think the Mexican constitution is very vivid because uh, if you see, it is very easy to reform it. Uh, <laughs> you, you, if you, you need two thirds uh, of the Congress and later on you need a majority of the states. But many of majority. the reforms don't, don't came from the, what we say here, the we people. Yes. No, the, are presented uh, from the diputados, senadores, but not from the people exactly. That's a, uh, I think that's a, a world problem. Um, uh, people uh, uh, don't feel represented uh, by, by politicians, that's, uh, and that's generating a lot of problems right now uh, in the world uh, with populist candidates that are saying, uh, well, they don't represent us. So I would be, I would be uh, uh, against uh, giving so much power uh, to the people. And you know why? Uh, because it can it can create monsters among politicians. So so sometimes you need a perfect balance between uh, uh, how difficult you make it uh, uh, for people to express uh, their 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 fears into the into their into their documents. Uh, because if if you have a wave of populism, for example, and you have very easy, uh, very very simple tools in order to to take those feelings into the document, you would create monsters, uh, legal monsters. For example, if, if Jean-Marie Le Pen uh, obtains power in France and, 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 they, and if they had uh, an, an easy tool in order to place words, uh, people's words, into the documents, that would, be that would be very, very dangerous. For that reason, I think that we cannot leave a door completely open uh, for, for the people to, to express uh, their feelings. It, it, it is very nice to say, with the people, but with the people can be very, very dangerous in, 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 some, in some historical moments. No, and, and the thing is, it's a really tough question mm -hmm. of constitutional design, because the, the, the danger in one direction is precisely what you uh, uh, stated, Raul, having, having too, perhaps too much change, uh, a reform of fundamental values that we may regret later. The alternative is if you, ha if you make it far too hard, mm -hmm. um, there's a sense in which maybe we lose the spirit of constitutional reform and popular sovereignty. And I think the byproduct of that is sometimes uh, constitutional develop development through the courts and through litigation. And so it, it, it's tough to figure out where is sort of the right spot on, on, on the spectrum. So maybe uh, this so complicated process allow us to take the passion out of the proposals and really rethink those proposals, give us the time to rethink those proposals so that the, the legislative uh, branch can have the complete idea really uh, knowing what they are going to do That's with the proposal. That's a very good observation, yes. So? That's a very good observation. If, if, you, if you have a difficult process, it's, it's very difficult for, uh, for uh, you know, very exalted people to, to, to react, to, 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 to to react and to, to be able to place their ideas into the document. The problem is that the Mexican document is so easily uh, changed that any any politician, uh, you know, any messiah who com who comes to who comes to, to power, and, and and we have many right yeah, now in have. Mexico, uh, um, will will place uh, uh, the people's will, which is not always good, and and uh, into the document. And 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 I believe in civil society, but I am I am afraid of civil society. Well, and, and, and Article 5 of our Constitution was seen as a great and important reform by the, the, the folks at the Constitutional Convention precisely because they wanted to regularize the process of reform. Um, if you don't actually put the amendment process in there, there's then, what, you have armed rebellion or you rip up the Constitution. And so um, they wanted to make sure that there was a formal mechanism in place um, that, would, that, that would sort of permit us to, um, uh, to, to change it. I mean, the larger idea behind both our legislative system and that, that, that amendment process was precisely that the churn in the system will slow us down, promote deliberation, and eventually allow us to think fully, reason together, and either come to consensus for action or more often than not, uh, end up in inaction, which the founders often thought would, if you had to err on the side of action or inaction, probably better inaction because mm -hmm. it protects our liberties. Um, and so again, it's, it's, uh, sometimes that can be frustrating. 
uh, and sometimes that can sap confidence in government, uh, confidence in ourselves, and constitutional reform. Um, but it's it's a necessary trade-off. The problem is that in Mexico we had too much action. That's that's the problem, <laughs> and, and 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 we need. Do, uh, do you think it's a problem? Really? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, at the end, I think that, uh, and I think that we are on the time now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that celebrating the centennial of the Constitution is not only celebrating that we that the document as a, as a document. It's also celebrating the history of Mexico. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At the end, we learn about our past, uh, we understand our future, our, our present, and we try to t build for the future. And that's the idea of mm -hmm. celebrating the centennial of, of our Constitution. I, I think that, and that's my personal idea, I don't think that we need to rewrite the Constitution, just take it out. I think that the main ideas are there, but we need to take out a lot of things that we have incorporated in there, like the mono monopoly ideas and education. It needs to be a, a smaller article. But that's just my idea. I know that nobody's going mm -hmm. to take that my idea. <laughs> but, uh, I, uh, but for us, it's really important to, to have this type of discussion, especially because many of the, of the articles of Mexico were taken from the North American Constitution. You said that the, the type of writing that our Constitution has is with a lot of words. Well, just see how we talk <laughs> in Mexico. <laughs> we talk a lot. No? We like to be very baroque in our expressions. And that's how Mexicans are. We will never talk like American people that you ask them, are you happy? Yes. No? no. Yeah, they ask you, are you happy? Yes, because today the sun came from the south and from the east. We give you a lot of information. That's how we are. That's how is our constitution now. But uh, thank you, both of you, for being here today. It was a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank for you. the consulate and the Mexican Cultural Center, it was also a pleasure to have you here. I think, thank you so much. I think that uh, now we have, uh, uh, we are going to, we have a recognition that we are going to give to our panelists. Oh, sorry, because he doesn't have, like, civil society. Which, uh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> but if you have any question, now is the time to make it. Is there any question? Uh, there is another microphone on the other side. <laughs> So in the last um, sort of several two decades, the Mexican political um, landscape has become more competitive in terms of parties. Um, how, uh, how competitive is it uh, in, in one sense, but also how is that impacting people's constitutional understanding as the PRI sort of erodes its, its power base? Well, uh, the Mexican system is, is quite competitive. Um, I think it is democratic. Uh, we don't have a doubt uh, about it. In, in fact, it's, it's, um, it is possible that, that the most uh, feared candidate uh, will win the next election, uh, a very leftist uh, candidate. Um, there are some fears in Washington about that. Uh, I don't know if, if in the present administration, because maybe they are not well informed about the world, but, but in the last administration, there was some, some fear about that. So I think Mexico, it, it, it's competitive, but that, that doesn't, doesn't help the Constitution because even some people who are into the academic realm, they don't get it, they don't know the articles. You cannot know uh, 136 articles uh, when you have, for example, in the US Constitution, seven articles. So, so, um, it is very difficult to, to get that document, even if Mexicans uh, um, go into politics all the time a little bit more and more and more. We're going to take another question right here. The, oh, I'm sorry, this person. Hi, yes. My question for both of you are, is how can, well, for the American Constitution, um, how can the American Constitution today catch up to the 21st century? Because it seems like we're still in the early, like the early stages of the Constitution, um, I guess would say that 
how can we as a society and as we embark further down into the 21st century, how can we match up with um, the eras of the Constitution as it was founded, as reforming as it can be today? Like, how can we, um, how can we change the Constitution as we move forward down the 21st century, if that makes sense? It, it does. I mean, I think, you know, meeting together and, and, and talking and trying to figure out what reforms we think are right. I mean, I think that there is certainly a, a large subset of the American people that, that revere the Constitution and, and don't want to amend it and fear amendment. Um, I mean, I think that one nice thing about the way the Constitution itself is uh, framed now is that both with the, you know, the, the, the powers granted to the federal government in Article One and Article Two, combined with some of the powers you know, granted in, for instance, the Reconstruction Amendments, that there's a lot of things that we can, if there are things, if there's reform that we want at the national level, we have a framework for doing that. Um, I mean, I, I think otherwise, we have to do what other generations have done, which is um, if there's a reform you want, you have to join together with your fellow citizens and try to traverse the very, very difficult Article V amendment process. And the only way that would change is if we decided to rewrite the Constitution in a fairly fundamental way, which I don't see a lot of will for that, but you know, things, <laughs> if there's one thing we know about American history, it can change, change quickly, um, and that there is a constant American impulse to try to form a more perfect union, maybe that's one way to do it. And we're going to have the last question. I'm sorry, like if somebody else has a question, I uh, would suggest to write it down. So maybe you can uh, send it to, to the speakers and they can reply to us. Okay. okay. Uh, my name is Obed Arango. Uh, I was 15 years professor of UNAM in Mexico of cultural anthropology. And here I have been professor for 10 years also of cultural anthropology. They have, I, I have been tasting the waters on both sides, no? <laughs> and then I have a question for each of you. Uh, the first one is, uh, is about uh, the Constitution here in the United States. It seems to me that the Founding Fathers and the Constitution is a very strong uh, icon, and uh, that many times is untouchable, in which the minorities didn't fit at the beginning. Therefore, the question is, uh, uh, it was not formulated for the minorities. Then through history, we have seen that. And what things has to change in American Constitution for minorities be embraced at full? Um, in, in the Mexican uh, uh, Constitution, it's exactly the opposite. Every sexennial, it seems that everybody wants to touch it. Mm -hmm. and, and I, Dr. Bringas, I, I am with you. I, I, be, I believe that a new constitution is needed. Mm -hmm. And my question for you is, uh, what elements in your idea, if there is a, a new constitution, uh, should be part of uh, for today, no? for the coming, I will say, 50 years? No? What elements do you consider of a new constitution should be emphasized. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. oh, for, for me, it's very easy uh, to go back to the Juarista Constitution of 1857, which was a political framework just as the American Constitution is. Just a political framework, very general, don't go into very particular uh, things, leave that to the states, uh, and that's the perfect recipe for having a, a stable constitution. Uh, for that reason, the US Constitution has been the most successful constitution in the world because every single country, and believe me, I have read constitutions from Uganda to Japan, every single country makes the same mistake as Mexico. They go into particular themes. And the American Constitution is, I think, the exception. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that as, as to minority rights, um, I, 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 I would think that modern Americans should take inspiration from our constitutional arc. Um, the idea that one of the key features of the American constitutional project has been the constant expansion of who counts and who counts among we the people. Um, you know, we see that enshrined in the Constitution. Uh, through the ending slavery at the 13th Amendment, promising liberty and equality against state abuse in the 14th Amendment, the expansion of African American voting rights in the 15th Amendment, the women's voting rights in the 19th Amendment, onward and onward. Um, and also the capacity, because of the Reconstruction Amendments, of our ability to pass 
federal laws, fundamental federal laws that protect minority rights that didn't exist before. So the Civil Rights Act of 1964 being an example. And I think it, it, it again, it has to, we, we have to learn from that history, figure out what it is that we're dissatisfied about what, how our country is right now, join together with our, our fellow citizens and make it better, whether that's through a constitutional amendment or whether that's through fighting for legislation at the state and local level or whether that's fighting for um, legislation in Congress. I mean, we have a framework for creating change um, and we should remain optimistic because we as Americans have done it over time. Another question? Okay. Thank you. To Mr. Bringas and Mr. Donnelly and to Consul Kerber for the discussion. Um, I'm now going to pass the time to Councilman David O, who has a citation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me first recognize my colleague, Councilman Al Tomberger, is here. Just wanted to recognize him. We act as a body. <clears throat> It is uh, my uh, honor to uh, uh, present a citation on behalf of the city of Philadelphia to commemorate the 100 year anniversary of the Mexican Constitution. I would like to present this to Consul uh, Kerber and also to the distinguished guests who are here. Um, ultimately, uh, we are honored in uh, Philadelphia to have this dis discussion to host this in our city of the foundation of our nation's liber liberty and an inspiration to many other countries as well. The Constitution that we are commemorating has been in existence for a hundred years. And it may be time for change or it may be time to not change it, but it serves the people and ultimately if it serves well, it will continue. If it does not serve well, it will be changed, but really it reflects the values and aspirations of the people to have a democratic society with equality and justice and its high, highest ideals and place limitations upon uh, those aspects of government that may not serve it well. And so with that in mind and all of you who are here uh, from the Mexican American community, from Mexico, and those who are from Philadelphia who admire and support our relationship and the uh, camaraderie we have with the nation of Mexico and its aspiration, I'd like to present this citation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. On the contrary. Ask uh, Councilman Tomberger to come up and take a picture as well. <laughs> That's how democracy works. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you for coming. Us. Honored as Philadelphians, the birthplace of our own constitution, yes. that you're here no. celebrating this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We are ready. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman O. And thank you, Councilman Tarnwriter, um, for the wonderful citation. And we we'll now introduce Rafael Utrera, President of the Mexican Cultural Center, to give us the closing remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of you for coming here. And I hope that if we write another constitution in Mexico, we can have the different points of view that we have heard here. And especially that uh, women can be incorporated in the writing of this constitution. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you. Gracias. 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 Well, uh, I uh, want to thank each and every one of you tonight for joining us in the uh, 100th anniversary of the Mexican Constitution. Uh, as they mentioned at the beginning of the night, this has been in the works for about a year. And so uh, I want to thank uh, the president of the uh, Constitution Center, the, the National Constitution Center, Mr. 
uh, Jeffrey Rosen. Uh, there has been a lot of work and I think it was well worth it. Uh, I also want to thank, uh, on behalf of the uh, Mexican Cultural Center and the Mexican Co uh, Consulate of Philadelphia, uh, the participation of Mr. Uh, Raul Bringas and Mr. Thomas Donnelly. And uh, we have a, a small recognition for your participation in this uh, panel debate and uh, for providing us for such an insightful comparison of the uh, Mexican Constitution and the United States Constitution. So, oh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Terrific. Thank you. And, and just in, so in, in, in closing, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, it's, it's part of my uh, recognition. I do want to thank Mr. Al Tommenberger and uh, Mr. David O for, for being here with us tonight. Uh, thanks again to everyone. Oh, one last thing. I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. Uh, as part of the Mexican Cultural Center, we do have a, a table outside of the auditorium where we have information regarding the Mexican Cultural Center. We do have a lot of events throughout the year. We would love for you to, uh, to join uh, the uh, Mexican Cultural Center if, if you could, or if not, to participate in some of the events that we have. Uh, so I look forward to seeing uh, most of you in some of the events that we have upcoming. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I think so. Now we can. <laughs> It was very fun. Thank you so much. Very good. Very good. Great. Thank you.